It's about that time, maybe a couple minutes early. But uh, since we haven't made it through a lesson yet, I thought maybe we'll stay a couple minutes early. <laughs> We've been trying. But appreciate everybody's attendance here. And uh, uh, what a great uh, looking day it is. We're just blessed to be here and be able to have the opportunity to come and worship God. Uh, we're going to finish up again lesson seven. There's just a, uh, I think, a very important chapter that we need to review and talk about. That uh, I mean, it means a lot to me. And, and so we'll be discussing chapter of, of Acts chapter 20 in just a little bit. Uh, after we, we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we just uh, thank you for each and every blessing that we enjoy as your people and as your children, uh, as your priest here on earth. We uh, thank thee for your word and, and how you've blessed us uh, with your word, that we know what sin is, that we know what we need to do to save our souls. We also have the opportunity to go to heaven and spend eternity with you. Uh, we, it's just countless, the many blessings that we have, and we're just thankful for each and every one. And even though we might not thank you enough, we just praise you for what you've done for us and how you've blessed us. We're thankful for this congregation, the many talents and abilities that we have, and the people here that uh, uh, love you and that work for you and that try to please you and glorify your name and everything they say and do. We just uh, ask a special blessing on us as a congregation. May we continue to always please you and to do, do your will. Be with the sick of our number and also the ones that uh, have had surgeries. Uh, be with the ones that are shut in in the nursing homes. Uh, be with the doctors that attend to them. Be with the families that uh, are dealing with the, these problems and the things that they're going through. And continue to watch over them and give them a special blessing. Forgive us for many sins in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, Acts 20. Um, again, is uh, we're finishing up this, this lesson here. And uh, we're going to... Uh, basically from Corinth to Jerusalem, and we're going to move on down to uh, uh, point two. But if you turn your, your Bibles to Acts 20, um, and we will begin uh, about verse 17 and read uh, Acts 20. But I just think uh, uh, we didn't get to this last week, and as we, we read over this uh, visit that Paul has with the uh, Ephesian elders and, and what he says in this speech here, um, as an elder, it, uh, it, it really touches my heart whenever I read this chapter. Um, but I, it, to think about it, it should touch each one of our hearts, really, about what could happen to the church here at Jackson Heights uh, that, happened, that, is, that Paul is, is prophesying or predicting that what's going to happen to them. And if you think about it, where do most problems in the church start? From within, don't they? If you think about it, from within. Isn't that, isn't that scary? Isn't that hard to think about or to really, you know, uh, draw your mind towards is that here the people have the truth like they had here at, at Ephesus. Uh, not only the truth, but they had, uh, again, the uh, apostles and, and several apostles. It was a great church. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at some verses and, and uh, uh, kind of go over the uh, many uh, people that were involved with this church. But here's a strong probably a gigantic church, a mega church as we might call it today, uh, but they're going to fall away and it's going to start with the elders. Uh, so how scary that is. And so what I'd like to say to you, keep a check on me. Uh, make sure what I'm teaching or preaching or what I stand for, you know, is, is scriptural uh, and that I've got authority that uh, what I preach or teach and talk about and all the elders. Um, and that's a scary thing is to know what they had uh, and the many blessings they had as a congregation that, they, that, that Paul's going to tell them they're going to fall away and it's going to start with the elders. And that's what's so scary to me. But it can start from any, not just the elders, it can start from anywhere. If, and, and we know historically what happens to the church uh, and, they, and they do fall away uh, because we talk about the, what country is Ephesus in? In Turkey, right? How many, how many churches of Christ do you think are in Turkey today? There might be some, might not be able to find them. <laughs> you might not be able to find them. I'm sure there's some somewhere, uh, and they probably got to hide the, you know, where they worship or how they serve God. But, you know, that, that, that's what's the scary part is we look at here in the south, the Bible Belt, and how many churches of, of Christ or, or God's churches that we have here, uh, and we think they'll be here forever. Uh, you know, if you don't stand for God's, God's truth, we might not be here either. Uh, hopefully, I'll never see that, but again, Think about, you know, we all got grandchildren now, or most, a lot of us got grandchildren to think about what they'll go through. So again, that, that's why it's so important that we stand for the truth, that we preach the truth, that we teach the truth, and that we have authority for the things that we say and do. Uh, so we won't be led astray. 
uh, like, uh, again, the Ephesian church is going to be led away. But let, let's start in verse 17. I just want to kind of read through this and, and uh, uh, take it to your heart and think about the words that Paul is saying here uh, and relate it to our lives and in in, in the church here and the importance of, of, of what we say and do and uh, what we teach here. But in verse 17, it talks about, From Elitus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. And how I did not shrink from declaring you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house. So Paul taught them everything they needed to know to be a Christian and to get to heaven. Same thing, you know, hopefully everybody is getting here, that they're, they're getting everything that they need. Uh, they're being fed en uh, enough to help them get through this, this life uh, and to uh, look forward to eternity. But solemnly in verse 21, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now behold, bound in the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life uh, of any account as to dear myself, uh, dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So we see uh, they freely had the grace of God. You know, that's an unmerited favor. And God wants everybody to be saved and everybody to go to heaven. And so Paul preached and taught that, the Jew and Gentile alike no respecter of persons, and that everybody had that opportunity, and it was freely given. It's a free gift from God that we all have, and that the whole world has, and doesn't take advantage of it, the gift that God is trying to give everybody. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about uh, preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. So Paul is telling them here, this is the last time that they will ever see him. Uh, as he's pleading with them, as he's preaching and teaching one last time, that this is the last time that they will ever see his face. Uh, so you can see how emotional this had to be for Paul. Uh, uh, because he, he, uh, we read last week he spent three years in this church teaching uh, continually. And uh, therefore I testify this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I do not shrink from declaring you the whole purpose of God. So again, we could be innocent of, of, of the blood of all men also if we preach and teach the truth here. Uh, you know, it, it, we're bound and accountable for what we teach and preach here, but also for what we preach and teach in our houses and our homes and out in the public and what we stand for. Uh, you know, don't let anybody uh, pull you away from what the truth of the gospel is and try to incorporate or tell you that this is wrong or, or this was 2,000 years ago. I know we always hear that statement. This, this, you know, this, this stuff that Paul was teaching, it was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply to us today. We've got a better way to serve God or whatever excuse they might come on. But Paul said this, this is what's most important, that the whole counsel of God is, is preached and taught. And then verse 20, they say, Be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So again, you just think about that church and the many blessings that they had and the many teachers and preachers that they had. And he's telling them to their face, you know, you elders that are listening to me right here and that are going to be crying and, and, and all upset that I'm leaving, you no longer see me again, you're going to be the ones that are going to pull the church away from, from Jesus Christ. You know, what a scary statement. Uh, what a guilty, some of them had to have some kind of guilt and, and if, I'm sure that he's preaching here, some of them already had in mind how they were going to pull the people away from the gospel of Christ. Whether well, these were Jews or Gentiles, we're not told they were elders, so they're probably a mixture of both. But some, but some of them were going to pull them away from, from the church of God, from the church of Christ, uh, and, and uh, they end up losing their souls. A couple other things uh, to mention there. Uh, let's see, joins Paul. Okay, uh, he talks to Ephesian elders. He's, he's reviewing their work. He's warning them of the dangers from within and without. So again, not only from within, but again, they're going to pay attention. Maybe the Judaizing teachers come within the church uh, as, as uh, uh, Paul is leaving. And maybe they probably had plans, I'm sure, to tear these churches apart. And if we look on he's committing them to God and to his word, reminding them uh, of his own example. And so if you read on further down, 
he, he, he's telling them what a great example he had for them. Uh, look at his example, how he worked and how he, he taught them and, and uh, uh, cried with them and, and pleaded with them to follow the gospel of Christ. So again, he's the person that we should follow, or they were telling him. And then he, he, he part, he's partnering with prayer and great sorrow. And if you look down in, in uh, uh, verses uh, 36, he says, When he knelt down and prayed with them all, they began to weep aloud and embraced him and repeatedly kissed him grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. So all of them were emotionally in at this time. But, you know, how do you think they felt as they went back to their homes? You know, did they look at each other? Is it you? Kind of like when Jesus was with the apostles and told them one would be a traitor. Uh, you know, did they look at each other and say, well, you know, it's not me. You know, who could that possibly be? You know, knowing, not knowing that it was Judas at the time. It didn't take them long before they knew. But, you know, they had to be sizing each other up, I would say so, because that's just a human nature. Who, who is it going to be? Who was Paul talking about as they go? We're not told how many elders there were. I'm sure that, uh, there was, you know, more than two, we know that. But there, 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 were, there was quite a few number, probably, because as big as this church was. So, again, you think about when he parts with great sorrow, it was just hard to, admit, to imagine uh, what they're thinking about. But as we talk about the Ephesian church, um, turn to 1 Timothy. And just kind of review of, of, of uh, the many blessings that they had as far as teachers and preachers were concerned. Look at 1 Timothy uh, 1 and verse 3. It says, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. So Paul, as is, is he leaves Timothy at the Ephesian church, and he's here preaching there and teaching, he's warning that there's going to be certain men that are going to teach strange doctrines. And then in verse 4, he says, Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But their goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teacher of the law, even though they don't understand either what they are saying or the matter for which they make confident assertion. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So using scripture to, uh, again, to twist things around. Maybe they're trying to bring the old law back into the, to the church or whatever it may have been. But uh, again, a false teacher is anybody that doesn't preach the truth. So we might know good moral people that are, that are teachers or preachers in denominational bodies, but if they're not teaching the truth, uh, again, we, as we looked at later, they're called devils. Uh, they are false prophets. They're teaching a false gospel, and they're going to lose their souls over it. And that's what the importance, again, as you think about, the, uh, you know, us as elders here, and sometimes we make judgments that not everybody agrees with. But again, we make judgments because we want to make sure that we not only keep our souls safe, but your souls also. Because everybody's got different ideas. We're just human beings about how things should be run or what would be good or what would be better. Uh, but again, you make these judgments and you, you spend a lot of time praying about them and talking about them, but you're doing it for the benefit to make sure everybody's in a safe condition. And that's the decisions that we make as elders. Uh, you know, and, and we are accountable for those things. But you look at even the brotherhood here in Columbia. Do we know of, of the brotherhood that has slipped away and brought things into the worship service? Well, how did it start? The elders let it happen. They, they were taught something or learned something or something brought somebody forward, whether it was a preacher or whether it was another elder, and now they've let those things seek into the church, and they're pulling away from the truth. So those are false teachers. I don't care if they call themselves a church of Christ or if they, they claim to be a church of Christ. They only got one doctrine to go by, and, and that's a doctrine that we all have, and that's, that's the scriptures. But we've got to have authority for what we do, and so that's why this chapter means so much to me is that we've got to be so careful uh, and, and, and our judgments have got to be you know, on, on, on cue, but as far as our judgments are concerned as elders and also you, yourselves also, it has to be scripturally. It has to be with authority that what we practice and what we do. And then look over at, uh, uh, in verse 18 and 19 of chapter 1 and uh, what he's telling uh, Timothy here. He says, But I command and I trust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwrecked in regard to their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will not be taught, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. So again, here's here's two uh, leaders again in the church of Ephesus uh, again are losing their soul because of what they're teaching. And Paul is warning Timothy, don't pay attention to them, because he has already turned them over to Satan, because that's the direction that they're headed. 
and he's turned them over. And then also look at, we think about uh, uh, the Apostle John. Uh, and uh, again, was at Ephesus for a long time. Uh, he was put in, uh, in jail on an island right off of Pathos and where he, where he uh, heard about the, uh, the word of revelation, was given that revelation. But look in 3 John uh, verses 9 and 10. 3 John verses 9 and 10, it tells us, uh, I wrote something to the church, but, but Diophyses, who loved to be first among them, uh, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does unjustly, accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. So here's, here's a, a, a member of the Ephesian church, probably an elder, uh, who won't even accept the brethren that want to practice the truth and puts them out of the church. And, and what happens here is he is more important uh, than the Word of God. And he's causing problems, and John's going to straighten this out if he gets back, uh, when he gets back and has the opportunity. Uh, and then we all know in Revelation chapter 2 what happens to the Ephesian church. If you look at uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, when uh, Christ is talking to John here, in, in the vision here, he said to the angel of the church in Ephesus, I write, starting in verse 1, the one who holds the seven stars in his, night, in his right hand, the one who walks with the seven golden lamps, says, says this, I know your deeds and your toll and perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against it that you have left your first love. This first love was probably the, the apostles' teaching. This first love was the love they're supposed to have for each other. But again, they were perverting the word of God and are not standing for the truth. And so we look at the Ephesian church, you know, they're going to be done away with. And it comes true. They're not there no longer. But again, Christ is warning John, you know, to go back and tell them that there's problems in that church. You might be a great church right now, but you've lost your first love. Have we lost our first love? You think about it. We as a church or as a body of believers or you as a member, have you lost your first love for Christ? Does the word still mean the same thing when you become a Christian? I know I feel like I'm preaching today, but I'm trying to get some points across. But I just think it's just so important, you know, it, it, it going through the, this class and, and talking about these things. You know, we've got to remember what our first love is, and that's the gospel of Christ. And remember that and stay with it and stick with it uh, because that's the only thing that's going to get us to heaven. And then one last uh, verse is just uh, uh, 2 Peter. And even Peter warned against the same things that, that, uh, that Paul is saying and informing them. But you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, and we'll start in verse 1. He said, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow this sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So not only did he warn the churches here at this time in the first century, this is for us today also. You know, if you think about uh, a lot of the preachers and teachers that we see today, a lot of them are doing it for greed. But they're, they're, pulling, they're, they're, they're pulling people away. They're false prophets. And so, again, we've got to know who they are. So what can we do not for this not to happen at Jackson Heights? You look at the warnings and the things we've read. How, how can, what can we do? To make sure this doesn't happen here. Okay. What are some other things? Pray. Pray? Absolutely. Because, you know, Satan is knocking at the door every day. He's knocking every day. If you think about it, even in your lives, in our, in our individual lives, he's, he's knocking at our door every day. Just looking for opportunity. But we as a church... Also, as a body of believers, had to be aware of he's knocking at this church door every day, too, trying to get in and trying to pull us away. What are some other things? Study. Study. I mean, and it's up in each individual to know what the Word of God says also. I mean, we've got to study self, show ourselves approved. Right.
Right. When you think about, the, you know, if it comes from within, is this person going to be somebody that doesn't love us and, you know, somebody that, uh, uh, you know, just a troublemaker, uh, you know, and is going to make everybody mad? You know, it's going to be somebody that, that takes advantage of opportunities to split us apart in some way. Uh, you know, so we've got to be aware of those things. Uh, you know, we, we've got to call attention to those things, uh, you know, to, by letting somebody know. But, you know, there's also going to be people that, that, that are really maybe great teachers of the Word. But they could fall just like anybody else uh, and, and, and can split us apart or take us away from the truth. So there, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. Yes, Cindy? Right. Absolutely. Very good statement. Very good statement. As we study with humility and we have discussions with humility, and you know, anytime we, have, we discuss with a maybe a false teacher or somebody that uh, does not follow the truth, it's got to be done out of love also. Uh, you know, not that I'm right and you're wrong, per se, um, but again, as far as, as what's taught from the pulpit, it's got to be only the truth. Uh, and, that, and that's what we've got to be aware of. So I think there's things that we can all do, but we've, we've got to watch after each other also. You know, we've got to have enough love for each other that, you know, if you see somebody sliding or, or not coming to worship services, you know, where they at? Who's supposed to call them? Who's supposed to take care of them? It's up to each individual, am I right? It's not just the elders or the preachers or, or the deacons or whatever. It's, each individual should be checking on those people that are not here or, or have, have slid away. And, and we've had that happen here. And, uh, uh, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. But again, if you show love and concern for them, uh, for them uh, maybe it's a way you can pull them back and save their souls. But uh, so again, I said all that just to say it's just important uh, it, it moving forward as a, as a church here and as a body of believers here that we need to be aware of uh, that Satan's always at our door. And if it can happen to these great churches here that had, you think about it, these elders probably in this church probably had uh, miraculous gifts also because Paul was able to lay their hands on them. Uh, John was there, so they probably had a lot of gifts that, they, that nobody else had. But it didn't take long, and it, you know, when uh, Paul and John the apostles died, that they just fell away. And again, there nobody's there today, as far as these churches in Revelation are talked about. They're not there today, so all of them fell away. Uh, that we're told what happened in in uh, uh, Revelations. Moving on, question comments. Hope I got everybody's. Okay, let's move to uh, lesson eight. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem. Uh, and again, we, we can read, uh, he had been in a hurry to get there by the day of Pentecost. Uh, that, that's why he didn't go to Ephesus and visit at the city, he called the elders to him, with him. Uh, he had been delayed for several reasons. Uh, but if we think about his, his uh, arrival, must have been with some uh, great uh, anxious ex expectations. Uh, and he told the, uh, the elders that uh, uh, when he goes there, that things were going to happen to him. What was going to happen to Paul when he went to Jerusalem? What's that? When he went to Jerusalem, what happens to Paul? What, what did he know was going to happen? He was going to be arrested. He was going to be bound. You know, a prophet, uh, Agabus, had told him that he was going to be bound and put in chains. Did that stop Paul from going? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He knew what was going to happen to him. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing about this, when this uh, third journey is over, it, he didn't go back to Antioch this time. He always had gone back and, and filtered back to Antioch, but uh, he probably never went back to Antioch again after th this arrest here at Jerusalem and, uh, and the things he had to go with. So we look at the brethren receive him in chapter 21 is where we'll start and look at uh, in verse 17. Um, it says that after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Uh, and the following day, or the next day, he and his uh, companions visit James and the elders. Um, so as, as soon as he gets there, he wants to meet with the leaders. And they have a discussion and talk about the great things that has gone on in this missionary journey and in, in his life of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, again, they're very excited. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, probably have a great, uh, kind of like a family reunion, I guess you kind of call it. 
Uh, now those could be good, sometimes they're not good, but anyways, uh, this time was, it was a joyous occasion as they, they came together and had these discussions. And then he details what God had done, uh, and they glorified the Lord when they had heard this. Um, but again, there was some problems here. Uh, on the next day, he and the companions, whoops, okay, and they tell Paul that uh, thousands of Jewish Christians have heard about him. So at the time of Pentecost here, there, there's probably uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Jewish brethren here in Jerusalem at this time to celebrate the feast of, uh, uh, the, of the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. And so he's telling them that there's going to be some problems here because all these, these Jews have heard a lot of different things. And again, all through his ministry and his, and his missionary journeys, uh, the Jews, the Judaizing teachers were his worst enemies. Uh, they, they chased him from town to town, uh, also uh, stoned him and, and uh, had him beaten up and, and, and all kinds of things. So a lot of them are probably in town uh, or in, in Jerusalem at this time. And so as they're discussing these things, they're trying to come up uh, uh, or tell him that uh, some of these Jews are thinking about that you are kind of like a false teacher about the old law. And if you read down there in uh, verse, he says, verse 21, And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise uh, their children nor to walk accordingly uh, to their customs. What then is to be done? And they will certainly hear that you have come. So something probably needs to be done to try to straighten these things out. Uh, that maybe that they will accept you. And so they kind of have a discussion about uh, what they need to do to move forward uh, with Paul being here in Jerusalem. Um, and what they do is they counsel uh, about Paul. And keep reading there in verse 23. It says, And therefore do this, and, and we will tell you, we have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses uh, so that they may uh, shave their heads and all which uh, know that... that uh, uh, all that will know that there is nothing to, to the things which have been told about you, but you yourself also walk orderly keeping the law. But concern the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having abstained that they should abstain from the meat sacrificed to idols and from blood and what is strangled and from fornication. So, um, you know, we talk about the vow that is mentioned here is to be purified along with the four men. So Paul, these leaders here are saying this is a, this is a good idea here, Paul is you get involved in this vow that these four men have taken, and then people will accept, the Jews will see that you're still observing some of the ceremonial things about the old law. Now, was there anything with observing the old law ceremonial? Nothing. I mean, you could still do that as, as a Jew, but it wasn't, the old law was not binding as far as a person's salvation was concerned. Uh, but again, they were, and you can see, this is thousands of years of tradition that you're having to deal with. Um, it's kind of like when somebody becomes a Christian that has been in a denominational body for years or brought up uh, maybe as a Jew or a Catholic or something like that. It's going to take him a lot of time to get over some of those things that he had been indoctrinated with. And, he, that, and that was going to have to be study and patience and, and uh, he got to read for himself and, and, and be taught in the more excellent way. So you can see the Jews are having a lot of problems. Uh, so they think that this is going to be a great thing. And then, you know, what is a vow, the Nazarene vow? In Numbers, uh, uh, it's, it's covered over there in Numbers uh, chapter 6, but it's talking about a vow is a separation with seven day, for seven days. And it entails anything produced by, by the grapevine you had to stay away from. Uh, the cutting of hair and the touching of a dead body. And it's covered in Numbers 6, 1 through 12. So they've taken this vow, so Paul is going to take this vow on himself also. And then the other part of it, it was a vow of sacrifice, with the sacrifice that included a male lamb as a burnt offering, uh, a ewe lamb as a sin offering, and unleavened bread, cakes, and wafers as a grain offering and a drink offering. So again, you were to bring this to the priest at the temple, and a ram as a peace offering, and the participants' uncut hair was also shaved and burned at the end of this vow. And so, so this just wasn't one thing, well, I'm going to take a vow, and for a couple of days, I'm just going to do this, do that. This is an expensive vow, if you think about it. So Paul is going to take on, and he's going to pay for the others, uh, a vow that they've taken on also. So if you look at these animals, you know, how much would it cost us to bring all these animals to the stockyard and sell them? So, I mean, you know, the, 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 this was a vow that also involved a lot of money, if you think about it. Uh, you know, we talk about tithing sometimes, you know, as a tenth. Well, even the Jews put a whole lot more than a tenth in their tithing and what they, and what they gave to God. But this is what they call the Nazarene vow, and, and you, you read about it periodically in, in the New Testament. And so Paul's involved in there. But they're thinking this is a great thing. 
that once you do this and once you take upon and, 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 and pay for also these four other men, that the Jews are going to accept you. So this is, a, this is a human kind of thinking that we come up with sometimes and that, you know, people are going to be pleased with whatever I come up with. Do we ever have religious discussions that we think, oh, here, I'm going to make this point here and this is going to convince them to obey the gospel? Do we ever think about that sometimes? I mean, I have. I thought, well, you know, if I bring this up and I show them this verse and, and, and this chapter, they're just going to say, absolutely, you're right, and I'm going to convert them. Or they're, or they're going to believe that I'm t- teaching the truth. How many times does that happen? Very rarely does it, does it follow through, does it? You know, or you might, uh, you know, want to teach a class or you, sometimes you hear a sermon that, that, that's uh, uh, really meant for a person to be there and they don't come that Sunday. You know, it just goes out the window. It's good that you still preach or teach that, but, but anyways, it, it doesn't happen. So uh, I think it's an idea they come up with and it probably would have worked. Uh, but again, did God not have another idea? You know, God told Paul what was going to happen to him. He just didn't know when it was going to happen. Or, or exactly what day and time, but you know, God's province is also involved in this a little bit. But it's a human idea that you would think would would, would work. Uh, but uh, uh, here we talked about uh, they're going to assure the Jewish Christians uh, that they what they have heard is false. Uh, that Paul himself was willing to keep the old law. So by going through this vow, he was telling the Jews that he was he, that he was keeping the old law also. And we'll look at some scriptures also. He was that's what he was teaching. There's nothing wrong with the old law. Uh, but again, they weren't going to accept that. Uh, that the Gentiles were not required to do so, but to keep the ordinance from the conference in Jerusalem, which we talked about uh, all, all the Gentiles were supposed to do was abstain from things uh, con- uh, contaminated by idols, uh, stay away from fornication, stay away from things that were strangled, and also stay away from the drinking of the blood or from, from uh, doing something with the blood. So that's all the Gentiles were required and not to follow the Old Testament uh, law. So his involvement with the vow, he agrees the next day and enters the temple. If you look over in verse 26, uh, verse uh, 21, it tells, But then Paul took the man the next day, purifying himself along with him, went into the temple and noticed, and uh, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered uh, for each one of them. So basically, he's having purified with them. He announces the date to which the days of purification would end and the offerings would be made for each one of them. Uh, just like in number six was supposed to be carried out, uh, his involvement. There are, there are three views, if you think about concerning. So if you look at Paul going this, you know, could we as Christians say, well, was Paul here keeping the Old Testament law and binding on, on people? Uh, and, and there are some people, if you think about it, there's a lot of churches today that still have the Old Testament law built in their worship services. Uh, there's also uh, uh, denominations today that uh, observe the, uh, the Sabbath. Uh, and still keep the old law. And they might use some of the teachings of Paul and take them out of context and say that, uh, well, look, this is what Paul did. He, he uh, followed what the old law was even though he was a Christian and take it out of context and, and form a, a religion out of it uh, and bind people uh, again today with a, a false concept about how God wants to be worshipped and where and when. And so if you think about it, a couple of views. Paul acted ignorantly, not aware that the law of Moses uh, was no longer binding. Uh, and then you could say that uh, unlikely since Paul preached the whole counsel of God. In, in, in uh, 20 and verse 27, he told the elders, he preached the whole counsel of God. He didn't hold nothing back. And basically that was the way to, to do away with the old law. And it's unlikely because Paul had already penned Romans 1 and uh, uh, 2 Corinthians and Galatians. Uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians, which clearly reveal Paul uh, was not ignorant that the old, old, old law had been done away with because that's what he taught. And he wrote to the other churches informing them of these things. So again, uh, uh, he, he was uh, not ignorant of what the, the gospel of Christ taught as far as the old law was concerned. And then it, uh, people could say maybe or might say that he acted hypocritically like Peter did in Antioch. And what did Peter do? He withdrew himself uh, from meet with Gentiles. Uh, so, you know, they could accuse, uh, uh, Christians could probably choose, or Gentile Christians might say, well, look, he's acting just like Peter acted. Uh, but we know he's not doing that because he approached Peter to his face and told him that that was wrong. So a- absolutely, he wouldn't be, he, he wouldn't be acting uh, uh, hypocritically and unlikely because uh, also Paul had endured so much mistreatment already, and unlike since Paul was willing to be bound to die for Christ. Uh, again, you know, he was standing firm for the Gentile Christians, and this is what is, is going to put him in prison here. This is what's going to get him arrested. 
uh, because of Gentiles. So he incorporated them in his life, and they traveled with him. And we'll see here uh, when he's arrested here in, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, sanctuary here is, is that he uh, was accused uh, of having Gentiles or bringing Gentiles into the sanctuary. And, there, and again, there are three views concerning Paul of that, but Paul acted consistently with what he actually taught. The law was no longer in force. And so let's look at, uh, let's look at Galatians. One real quick verse here. Galatians chapter 3, 24 and 25. And it tells us there that, uh, uh, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So the law was just a tutor or a teacher uh, about the mind of God and what was involved in obeying God and how we were, were to obey God. But it, it was just a, a, a beginning of, for, especially for Gentile Christians, uh, you know, they could look back and say, well, this is how the, the Jewish brethren lived, but the Jews already knew this. They already looked for a Messiah. Uh, they already looked and, and thought that the law uh, taught that there would be a Messiah in an earthly kingdom, etc. Uh, so again, but it's only a tutor and it's no longer, we're no longer bound under the old law no more. And so, but it is kind of strange to look at how many religions still have some of the old laws built into their worship and into their service to God uh, and, and bind this on people and, to, and ha think that they have authority for that. Yeah, Billy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read that in just a minute. I'll get that on there. And then, and then, and then give me a comment. Okay. Anyone seeking to be justified, the, ball, uh, the law was fallen from grace. And, you know, I think that's important also. If you look at uh, Galatians 5 and verse 4, it tells there, you have been uh, uh, severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So if you, you, you attempt to be justified by the old law, you're fallen from grace. You've lost your soul. If you're going to bind the old law on, on Gentiles, or if you're still following it and not following the gospel of Christ. Yes, ma'am. Justify, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and like an earlier lesson we talked about is they were binding circumcision to justify them to be a Christian, that you couldn't be saved unless you were circumcised. So they were taking the part of the old law that was optional and saying, no, you've got to do this or you're going to lose your soul. Right. And, and I think that's what people do today when they obey the old law. They think that's justification as far as God is concerned. And, but there's no law. Do, no, not at all. But again... I think here is you, it shows you, though, that if you bind the old law on people and that's where you get your justification for being saved, that you are going to fall from grace and that you're going to take people with you. So, again, this is another false teaching that, that's still alive today. And not only in Paul's time with the Jewish brethren, but with the Gentile religions today, lead people astray and, and then fall from grace. And then also, uh, yet a Jewish Christian like Paul could observe the customs of the law uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians, like Billy was talking about, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, and we'll read verses 20 through uh, 23. It says, To the Jews I became a Jew so that I might uh, win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak. That I might win the weak, I have become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker 
uh, of, of, the, uh, of the gospel. And so you see here, uh, the law of Moses contained a lot of ceremonial rites uh, that they observed. Um, and these could be observed, uh, but to keep peace and harmony, uh, you wouldn't be violating the, the gospel of Christ. Um, and so he was trying to win Jews by observing some of the traditions of the old law. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, it wasn't binding or it wasn't a salvation issue that you had to follow those. But you see, for thousands and thousands of years, just like with the, the, the comment I made about denominational bodies, I remember when I became a Christian, you know, was baptized here. There was a lot of things that I thought, you know, that, that need to be taught here that wouldn't be taught here. You know, I thought, well, hey, you need to, you need to do this. And, and, and where was the music? You know, I mean, that was some of the thoughts that I had. And, and I had to be taught that, but I also had to learn for myself. I had to read through that and, 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 and make myself a, a secure in what I believe. Um, and so same thing with the Jews. You know, they'd done this for thousands of years, and so it was hard for them to overcome those things. But, Jew, uh, but again, to save people's souls, you know, we've got to say it's okay to do some of those things. But they're not salvation issues. Uh, and so that's what we've got to be careful of. If somebody binds that and say, oh, this absolutely has to be done, uh, it, it's bringing a teaching that, that is not contained in the gospel of Christ. Uh, Billy, did you have a comment? I'm sorry. Absolutely. And, and you, you, we have to accept people where they are when they first become Christians and then work with them and teach them. Because, hey, uh, I just think that the elders and teachers years ago had patience with me uh, because, like I said, I, I just had to know uh, and, and asked a lot of questions and, uh, uh, because I, I wanted to make sure that, that me and my family were following the truth uh, that was taught uh, and being ignorant of a lot of scriptures. Again, I, I tell you, you know, growing up, heard a lot of stories about the Bible growing up, you know, thought I was a good Christian person. Uh, well, not really a great Christian person, but anyway, I thought I was a Christian. And, uh, but again, to, to learn the, the truth and, and how you must follow God and the certain things that you had to do. Uh, and again, I'm just uh, thankful that everybody had patience with me uh, as, as I was a young Christian. Comments about that? Okay. Let's move on. Let's see. Uh, uh, talking about... Uh, he acted consistent with what he actually taught, the three views. Again, a Jewish Christian could observe the elements of the law provided he did not do so seeking justification, for that comes only through the sacrifice of Jesus. He did not bind it upon others, especially Gentiles who were never under the law of Moses. So I could see that Paul was preaching the truth, uh, but he was trying to become all things to all people in order to save their souls. And then Paul's arrest in the temple. Uh, we might have to go kind of quickly through this, but uh, uh, his arrest in the temple... Uh, again, as he goes, there's uh, some Jews again uh, uh, from Asia again, uh, Judaizing teachers uh, uh, that uh, uh, see Paul uh, in the temple. And again, if you read through that, you know, it looks like they, they pull him out of the temple and they close the door so nothing bad is going to happen inside the temple and then start beating him. Uh, and again, this is a mob mentality. Um, you know, you ever, I guess periodically you'll see some of the, the, the Christians and what happens to them in some of those countries over there. It's kind of mob mentality where they'll pull somebody and, and beat them to death, uh, uh, you know, in a mob mentality kind of thing because they are, are talking about Jesus or have a Bible or, or whatever, and it, you'll have some of those. But again, it, one day, you know, it, it could happen here if you think about it. I mean, uh, I, I hope it never does, but, uh, uh, you know, whenever, uh, you know, that Jesus returns, you know, might happen. But, but again, it happens in a lot of countries where, you know, Christians are persecuted. But this is a mob mentality. Uh, it's the same thing as the brethren had heard. Uh, again, these are just kind of rumors that were circulating uh, that he had brought uh, uh, the Gentiles into the temple. Uh, a, a false presumption. It did not happen. Uh, and uh, they dragged Paul out of the temple, as I mentioned. Uh, he was rescued uh, uh, from the death by a Roman commander. At this time, you know, read commentary at this time, whenever they had a, a big festival in Jerusalem, uh, they would have a, 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 a thousand soldiers, uh, uh, you know, in Jerusalem at this time and have a commander over all of them. And they were looking for problems that it must have happened, you know, continually or all the time uh, and be on guard for, for something that might happen. 
Um, news came to the commanders, they were trying to, to seek and kill Paul. Again, this is all in, uh, it, uh, contained in chapter, Acts chapter 21. The crowd stops beating Paul when they see the commander along with the soldiers and centurions. So again, they just, without a, 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 a trial or anything, they just pull him out there like on, on, on the floor and just start beating him, uh, probably kicking him. And so again, you've got a big crowd around, so who's going to be guilty or who's going to be charged in this crime? be nobody would they because you know everybody's getting their licks in it's kind of like when they stoned Stephen you know he had no trial and they just dragged him out and just started throwing you know uh, stones at him and and killed him but how many stones did it take to kill him now it could have been a one big one but I'm sure they didn't stop throwing it you know even if he was dead at that time because you know that he prayed and then he asked the, for them their sins to be forgiven so he was probably hit many many times but who was the guilty person that, did, that threw the, the stone that killed him so in beating Paul here, nobody would be guilty. They'd just find a dead body laying around because there's such a mob mentality. Or how many people, we're not told, but it, uh, again, it had to be you know, probably uh, hundreds of people around him at this time. And so again, uh, his arrest at the temple, he's rescued uh, from death uh, uh, from, uh, by the Roman commander. And after binding him with chains, the commander is uh, uh, unable to determine why people are all, all uh, upset at Paul. And I'm going to say probably a lot of those people didn't even know why they were upset. You get involved in a, men, uh, a mentality or a, a, a mob mentality here is they're just going along with the flow. You know, uh, when a, a riot happens, do all those people know why they're rioting? You know, they're just, getting invo- they just getting involved and they start throwing rocks and breaking windows and stepping on cars or whatever. It, it's just a mob mentality, so a lot of them probably didn't even know it. So uh, uh, after binding Paul with chains, the commander's unable to determine it, and then Paul is commanded to be sent to the barracks. Uh, and, under, and then he asked to, uh, to address the, uh, the Jerusalem mob. Uh, permission is obtained from the Roman commander. And Paul seeks to speak to the commander who is surprised that Paul speaks Greek. Uh, again, you know, this is kind of a shock to him that, that Paul does speak Greek. And he, 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 uh, uh, when he goes to talk with this, as we see here in his, his conversation, then he starts speaking Hebrew to the Jews. Uh, so he was able to uh, uh, identify as a Jew to the Hebrews there. But with permission, Paul begins to speak to the mob in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, his address to Jerusalem mob uh, uh, in Acts 22. He reviews his early life. Let's look at that real quickly. We've got just a couple minutes. In Acts 22, verses 1 through 5. It says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he had addressed them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of, of Sicilia. But brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prison. And also the high priest and all the council elders can testify from them. I also received letters to the brethren and started off to Damascus in order to bring even those who were there in, to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. So he's talking about historically, look, look what I have done for the Jewish religion here. You know, I'm a Jew of a Jew. Uh, you know, I was taught by Gamaliel, the great teacher of, of the law. Um, I was dragging Christians back to Jerusalem. Even the high priest gave me permission. Some of those people in the audience had to know Paul, had to know what he was involved in earlier. Now, probably the majority may not have known, being in Pentecost at this time. But he's trying to justify, said, hey, you know, why are you persecuting me? Look what I did for, for, for the, the Jewish religion here. You know, you should respect what I did. I persecuted them also. But again, he's also going to tell the rest of the story. And he moves into the rest of the story. They're not going to accept the rest of the story. And yes, Rufus. This is so much like what's going on in the past. Oh, true. Yeah. We think, hey, this is so different now. Remember that thing? What? And you think about it. We've got to where we don't even want to have a discussion or hear somebody else's uh, other opinion today, do we? You know, we want to. We say we're for free speech, but the only free speech if you believe what I believe. I don't want to get into politics part, but, but you know, we're, we're talking about you can't even hardly get in a conversation uh, because people don't want to accept what we have to say about a, about a matter. And, and, and a, a religious discussion is about the same way also. And, it, and it's the same way, again, just like it was in, in Paul's time. But he talks about his birth, uh, his persecution. Uh, and his density relates to the circumstances of his conversion. And again, what, what were the circumstances of his conversion? He would just put his hand up and believed in Jesus Christ and was a, a Christian, right? I 
kind of say that. But anyway, you know, we, we talked about this. But again, you know, he was told what he must do to be a Christian. So he's telling him what, what his conversion was. He'd seen Jesus uh, on the road to Damascus. And then he was told exactly what he must do. And he was, he was baptized for remission of his sins. Also recorded in Luke and recorded again by Paul in Acts 26. Uh, but again, he refers to the vision in which the Lord told him to uh, uh, flee Jerusalem. Remember the first time he was in Jerusalem, he thought that he would be able to refute the Jews and, and show them uh, you know, what Jesus was going to do for them, whatever. But the Lord told him, get out of Jerusalem or they're going to kill you this first time. And uh, uh, so again, he listened to God and left. But uh, the Lord told him to go. And, it, and then he had to appeal to his Roman citizenship. Why did he, why did he have to uh, appeal for this? What was going to happen this time if he didn't appeal to his Roman citizenship? He was going to be beaten, wasn't he? You know, we, we talked about, you know, sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. You know, uh, uh, again, they, they, they strap him up and they put him in chains. And, and the, 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 the funny part about this, well, it's not funny, but, you know, they're going to beat him to get the truth out of him. You know, instead of just asking him what the truth is, we're going to give you, we're going to beat you with 40 lashes uh, till you can't hardly breathe. And, and you can't hardly survive, and then we, we think you'll tell us the truth then, if you, if you haven't died before then. So he, he does appeal to his Roman citizenship uh, uh, to uh, get away from the mob, uh, because, the, again, the Gentiles are angry, uh, and uh, the Roman commander prepares to scourge him. We talked about he's ordered back into the barracks to learn why the people are so angry, and he's spared because of his Roman citizenship. Again, he appealed to his Roman citizenship and uh, 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 saves him from a, another beating, uh, which he experienced many, many times. Uh, he is a Roman citizen. And again, the guilt that he puts back on the Roman soldiers because they have bound him and put him in stocks, uh, him being a Roman citizen without a trial uh, or without an accusation, really, because they don't even know what the problem is. And so they get ready to beat him. And so, uh, again, this commander, uh, again, uh, frees him. And uh, uh, again, he's going to uh, uh, go before the uh, council. And uh, we're about out of time. And we will pick up next week. Uh, with another lesson. Thank you all.